As I mentioned, our present series, <clears throat> looking at core values, and we've been doing this for a couple reasons. One, to see if we all agree that they're important and biblical. So this, your, if this is your church, you know, as you listen to them, is this something you agree with? Do you think they're biblical core values? And then the second part is maybe even more important, which is what must we do as a church family to make sure that we're operating uh, in these core values and, and these values in our church? So far, we've explored four of our values, authenticity, character, community, and servanthood. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Pastor Matt mentioned those cards. Last week, I talked about servanthood, and, and uh, as you leave today in the welcome desk, you'll see these cards, and we want to encourage you to find a place of ministry. Uh, I really appreciate those of you who have responded this week and told us where you'd like to serve. We really appreciate it. So now, today we're going to explore our fifth value, which is outsiders and insiders. Take a look. Take a look. Here we are. We value people outside our church and desire to point them toward faith in Jesus. We value people inside our church and desire to help them on their journey becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. I grew up in a great church. Uh, as I have been in ministry all these years, I realized even more what a great church I grew up in, and I appreciate it. We had good pastors. We had good leaders. I only have a few complaints about the church I grew up in. One of them that I, one of the complaints I have is that growing up, we were not allowed <clears throat> to go to dances. It was not something we could do as kids and teenagers. Consequently, all attempts to dance, uh, ever since becoming free of this dance restriction, have only encouraged others to mock me and laugh at me whenever I try to dance. And I will tell you that the mockery is well-deserved. But... Um, so knowing the potential for embarrassment that I would cause during the father-daughter dance, my uh, daughter, before her wedding, asked if my wife Melody and I would take dance lessons with her and her fiancé, and so we agreed. The first dance lesson <clears throat> was pretty intimidating for me because it was in this elementary school, on the north suburbs, elementary school gymnasium, smelled like elementary age kids had been there all day, and, and there were probably about 30 of us. And I walked in, and I was very nervous and very hesitant for a number of reasons, because I just wondered what was going to be going on. I really felt like an outsider. Would I have to dance in front of everyone? Would the instructor call me up and use me as an example? <clears throat> I didn't have any experience at all dancing, so I just assumed I would be embarrassed. A few lessons in, I realized that this must be how people who are outside the church or outside Christianity feel if they decide to go to church to get Christian lessons. You know, you go to dance school to get dance lessons. You go to church to get church lessons or Christian lessons. And I figured they, want, they must wonder, you know, will I have to read the Bible? I don't know the Bible. Will I have to pray? I don't know how to pray. Am I going to have to be in some small group and answer some religious question? Will they do something weird at the church? When do I stand? When do I sit? What about that thing they do with bread and wine? And what is that all about? They don't, they, they're just like outsiders. Thankfully, back to the dance class, the dance instructor had seen many types like me. And she was very good. And she knew that her responsibility was to make us outsiders feel welcome. So now I want to ask all of you to listen carefully. For any of us who are insiders in the church, we have a responsibility to make outsiders feel welcome. Not just if they come to church, certainly then, but even more importantly, when they come into our lives. Uh, family members, co-workers, neighbors, friends. I... Got my hair cut this week. Take a look. And um, <laughs> next to where I get my hair cut, there is a coffee shop. And sometimes I'll go in there after, which I did this last week. There was a young lady <clears throat> who was a barista, always somebody different when I've been there. So I said, oh, are you the owner? She said, oh, no, I just work here. And I said, oh, how's business? She said, oh, it's really, really great. And I said, uh, that's good. And she said, yeah, we've been going three years, and it's really good. I said, well, do you happen to know if the owner is looking to expand because we have a space where maybe he could 
open another shop. And she said, you know, it's really interesting because we were just talking about that just this week about expanding. And um, I said, okay, well, could I have his number? And so she gave me his card, et cetera, et cetera. And then she looked at me and she said, well, what do you do? And I always hate when people ask me that question <laughs> because whenever you say you're a pastor, people either look disappointed or they get nervous, like, oh, what did I just say? Did I swear or anything like that? <laughs> and, um, and so I, I don't like to answer it, and so I just, but I just said, oh, <laughs> I'm a pastor. And she did look disappointed, to be honest. Um, and so I just thought, well, she asked. I said, how about you? I said, you go to church? And she said, well, I did. I said, really? I said, you know, I'm going to be talking in my sermon this week about outsiders. She said, well, I'm not one to talk. She thought I was going to maybe try to, you know, preach at her or something like that. And I said, no, no, no. I just wonder if you could help me. And she said, oh, okay. I said, you said you went to church. And she said, yeah, I went to church between age 16 and 26. I said, well, how old are you now? And she said, which I've been told never ask a woman that question, but I did. And she said, oh, I'm 30. And I said, can I ask, why did you go and why did you leave? And she said, I, I went because I was in love with this boy who went to a youth group. And they were giving away cases of Mountain Dew. And so, um, so I went. And then I, I was in the church for 10 years. And I said, why did you leave? And she said, because it was so misogynistic. And because I just don't believe. I just don't believe anymore. One of the things she said before, when she handed me the cup of coffee, she kind of was thinking about it. She said, but you know what? I still have some of those friends in that church who are really good friends, and we hang out together. And as I was leaving, I thought, you know what? It's really good. She still has some Christian friends who haven't canceled her out, and I appreciated whoever they were. For any of you here today, or if you're watching online, if you consider yourself someone who is inside the church, if you consider yourself someone who's inside Christianity, I want to just tell you, you have a responsibility to make outsiders feel welcome. And if you are a person who considered yourself outside the church or outside Christianity, but you'd like to take a few Christian lessons just to check it out, and you're here today, I hope you feel welcome. And I hope you know that we're really glad you're here or we're really glad you're watching, and we thank you for coming. It's an honor to have you. Now, here's the interesting dilemma for those insiders, for those Christians. Jesus told all of his followers that he wanted them to go out and tell others about him. Here's what Jesus told his followers just before his ascension to heaven. Take a look. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus told all of his followers, all of his followers, to go out and tell others about him. Now, there are two problems with this, two challenges with this. One is, we're not all sure how to do that. Or we're, we're not necessarily comfortable doing that. We've we love Jesus, we're following Jesus, but telling others, we're not quite sure how, I don't know how to do it, I'm not really comfortable doing it. That's one challenge. The second one is not everyone wants to hear about Jesus. They're just not interested, kind of like this girl. I was like, oh, please don't. Don't be talking to me about that. But here it is. The commission by Jesus is right here. Go and tell. It's clear. It's right here in the Bible verses that we're reading today. So what can we do about those two challenges? And how does this apply to our core value here at Oak Hills, the one that we're exploring today? Well, here's the first thing that is really helpful, and it's right here in the text, and that is that Jesus has all authority. Jesus has all authority. We'll look at it again, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And then the very first part of the next verse says, therefore... So Jesus is saying, I have been given all authority, therefore go. So there's another therefore. This time it's Jesus. We've been talking about the therefores in the Bible that Paul uses a lot. If you've ever traveled outside the country, <clears throat> you know that when you return to the country, you have to uh, meet with a customs officer, and you have to answer some questions. And if you get a nice one, um, 
after he or she has been asking you questions, uh, they hand you back your passport, and they will say something like this. Welcome home. Welcome home. The first time I heard that, it felt so good. Uh, this was my country. I would love traveling. I love to travel. I love to go to other countries. I know many of you do. But there was something about him saying to me, welcome home. It's such a nice feeling to be back home in your country. It's especially nice to have your home country be a place where, for the most part, there is law and order and where proper authorities are in place to keep it that way. Now, I know we have plenty of problems here in the U.S. Please, I'm aware of it. But we are all very aware right now of the places in the world where the governments are authoritarian, they're ruling with intimidation, with control, with torture, with abuse, with warfare. Our Poland team is going to meet those people, many of those people, next week, whose lives have been devastated these past eight months. You've seen the pictures. You've heard the reports. What would it be like to be a part of that country? But here Jesus says, no matter what human person or what system is presently ruling over a country or over a state, the authority, Jesus says, that I have from God the Father trumps them all. The key word here is all. All. One of the first short-term missions trips that Melody and I uh, ever went on was to Germany. We went to university campuses out of Orlando. Uh, we took three different teams of 10, so 30 young adults. We had three different teams that went to three different campuses in Germany, and we did uh, just street evangelism. We, would, we did this uh, drama presentation, which lasted about 11 minutes. Oftentimes, we'd draw a crowd, and then we'd talk to students. And the, the uh, missionary that was there told us something the very first day before we all went to our different cities. He said, I want you to know that when you step on the campus, the power, the presence, and the authority of Jesus goes with you. These were incredibly high-end intellectual academic universities. And really the God of most of those students was really just humanism and intellect. And he said, don't be intimidated because the minute you walk on the campus, the presence and power of God and the authority of Jesus will be with you. And you set up the kingdom of God right there in the square in the middle of the campus. I can't tell you how many times that ministered to us because believe me, it was quite intimidating. So here's the thing, this is true for each of us in our world, where you all live, where I live, and uh, it works where we work. This is true uh, where we stop for a donut. This is true when we visit family members and friends. This is true when we go to work out. This is true when we sit watching uh, our children play football or basketball or hockey. Everywhere we go, the power and authority of God goes with us so we can do what Jesus asked us to do. And Jesus tells us to do two things. After saying, you know what, I have all authority, so it's all covered. And what does he say to do? Well, we read it. Here it is. He says, go tell outsiders. Therefore, therefore, since I have all authority, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the na nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Greek here, another way you could translate all the nations, it can be translated all peoples. I like that better, actually. All peoples. All peoples means all peoples. It means all languages, all nations, all colors, all different backgrounds, all peoples, not just some. Christmas is coming. I don't know if you're excited or depressed about that, but... I always get excited. I love Christmas songs a lot. I uh, play them a little too early, but um, started in July. And uh, <laughs> one of my favorites is written by Willa Hudson and Alfred Berth. It's called Some Children See Him. And my favorite singer of this song is James Taylor. And here are the lyrics. The, the song is about how children see Jesus. Some children see him lily-white, 
with tresses soft and fair. Some children see him bronzed and brown with dark and heavy hair. Some children see him almond-eyed with skin of yellow hue. Some children see him dark as they, sweet Mary's son, to whom we pray. The children in each different place will see the baby Jesus' face like theirs, but bright with heavenly grace and filled with holy light. O lay aside each earthly thing, and with thy heart as offering, come worship now the infant king, tis love that's born tonight. I love that song. I love those words. When I listen to that song, I often think, I often think this, because I've heard it so many times. I hear James Taylor sing it. My mind goes to how children see Jesus. And I think if, if people could really see who Jesus is, there's no way that they wouldn't want to have a relationship with Jesus. So I think the problem is they don't really know who Jesus is. But if they could, if they could almost seem like a child. Um, we're a part of the Assemblies of God. The Oak Hills Church is a part of the Assemblies of God. It started, okay, uh, the Assemblies of God started as a bunch of outsiders. Um, in the late 1800s, there were a number of Christians who began to experience uh, the moving of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and speaking in tongues as on the day of Pentecost. And these folks who began to experience this were kicked out of the, their churches uh, because people thought that wasn't for today, and so they were kicked out. They were trying to find, well, a revival started really all over the world, but in America started um, on Azusa Street in Los Angeles at the turn of the century, and something powerful was happening there as it was around the world in Los Angeles. Um, what was interesting about this, there's a picture of this group. Uh, they went for a number of years, but there's a picture of this group uh, uh, all hanging out together, like this big group picture. And in this picture is something. Now, remember, this is like 1904, 19, no, it's like 1901, 1902. Black people, white people together, 1901 in L.A., Women and men in ministry together, older and younger together. This was unheard of, really, in society. For example, women uh, were ordained in ministry from the time we ever organized as, as an organization. From the very first day, women were, that no, there was no uh, group of Christians that were doing that. And the connection of people of different races it, it really was an example of all peoples, all peoples. And so here's what's interesting. <clears throat> they started a, this movement, the Assemblies of God, uh, 1904, 110 years later. Get this, we now have 3.5 million adherents in the U.S., but we have over 70 million around the world because these outsiders knew that Jesus wanted them to go to the outsiders, and invite them to come in. Um, if we bring that close to home now and apply it to our lives, then it's really clear that Jesus has called each of us who follow him to tell all the people in our lives about him. And here's one other thought on this. I just want you to catch this, okay? This is the beauty, because I mentioned some of us were not quite comfortable. So hear this. The great thing is about telling others uh, about Jesus is we get to go as we are. We get to go as we are. Pastor Rod, I like to go and tell people about Jesus, but I don't know how. I'm not wired to do that kind of thing. Yes, you are. Because you get to go as you are. Just go about your daily life. <clears throat> and when you're with outsiders, those outside of faith in Jesus, in your own way, within your personality, just let them know they're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome to know Jesus. You're welcome to know me. You're welcome to know Jesus. Back in 2016, I did a pretty thorough study of outsiders, called them unchurched, people that didn't go to church, didn't know Jesus. Some people don't go to church. They do know Jesus, so I'm not making any statements there, but that's what I called them. But I did a study, and it's interesting. <clears throat> this is 2016. We're in 2022, so six years later. It's interesting that all of the predictions people made during that time about Christianity and about the church have happened, and then the pandemic happened. 
So, for example, church attendance was, has been in decline in America for about 12, 15 years. But then the pandemic happened, and it's declined even more. And instead of welcoming those outside the faith to come in, um, <clears throat> many, not all, but many of us Christian insiders were fearful, and so we gathered together to protect ourselves <laughs> from the outsiders. And now after the pandem pandemic's even stronger. If the outsiders want in, they first must agree to a certain set of issues or rules or beliefs, and then they can come in. You know, if Jesus would have lived that way, and if he would have lived by that philosophy, <clears throat> then this event that Matthew recorded would never have happened. Take a look at what Matthew wrote. He's involved in it. He's talking about himself here because he was a tax collector. Matthew 9, 9, passing along. Jesus saw a man had his work collecting taxes. His name was Matthew. Jesus said, come along with me. Matthew stood up and followed him. Whatever political party you belong to, what I want you to do right now is think of the person in the other political party that you really don't like. Think of that person, okay? That's the way good, God-fearing Jews looked at tax collectors. <laughs> they hated them. Verse 10, later... When Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house, can you imagine eating supper at Matthew's house? With his close followers, a lot of, dis, close followers, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. The outsiders must have felt welcome with Jesus. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and lit into Jesus' followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher acting cozy with crooks and misfits? Jesus overhearing shot back. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. I don't think any of us here today are watching online. In fact, I know this is true. I don't think any of us want religion. We just want a relationship with Jesus. That's what we want. And we want to tell others how wonderful that relationship is. So, folks, let's welcome them into that relationship. Jesus said, I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Here at Oak Hills, we don't want to coddle insiders, but we do want to disciple insiders. Since Jesus has all authority in the world, he commissioned us who follow him to tell outsiders about him. And here's what we've talked about, okay? Tell others about him. So here's what it says, to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we're supposed to tell outsiders and we're supposed to disciple insiders. So this is what Jesus says. I have all authority, it's that word all. I've been given all authority. So go tell all peoples and teach them to obey all I have commanded. One commentator wrote this. To disciple a person to Christ is to bring that person to accept Christ as his or her teacher, not just savior, but teacher. Christ is my teacher. Disciples are those who hear, understand, and obey Jesus' teaching. I won't assume for you on this, but I have heard a lot of sermons in my life. I've been to a lot of Bible studies. In fact, I just did a little math this week. Sometimes I do this. In 31 years of pastoring the church, I've preached over 2,000 sermons, devotional, and Christian lessons. My apologies to you who have had to sit through all of those. And I, I that was a joke. <laughs> so like three people laughed. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, laugh now. Okay, just laugh now. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do really well. Maybe you're like this. I do really well at hearing those sermons from others and myself, I do really well at understanding those sermons, but often I have trouble obeying all the things I hear, all the things I preach. There was this church, they lost their pastor, so they had to find a new one. You maybe heard about this church. And um, <clears throat> so they got a little committee together to get a new pastor. And so they had pastors come in, and they would try out. They'd preach, try out. And um, this third or fourth candidate came in, and this church just loved him. And, like, it was just great. <laughs> it loved his sermon. 
So they, at the end of this Sunday, and they all got together, the members got together, voted, unanimous, voted this guy in. And so he had to go home and get his family together and move in. So it was a number of weeks later when he was then going to be like the pastor. He was going to be installed as the pastor. So he got up. Everybody was excited. A lot of people came. He got up and he preached the same message that he had preached before. And they thought, well, that's okay. It was a good message. So, you know. So the next week, they're all excited. We'll get to hear his next message. Well, it was the same message a third time. Now they're getting worried. So they come back and fourth time, preaches the same message. So all the members get around like the head board member, you've got to talk to the new pastor. You know. So the board member goes up to him and says, Pastor, I mean, that's a great message, but that's like the fourth time. He said, oh, did I not tell you? He said, I always preach the same sermon until we all obey it, and then I go to the next sermon. Okay. And so I think that's pretty good for what I need to do in my life, and maybe you need to do in your life. What's interesting about this passage is it has in it the very first act of obedience of an insider, which is they decide to be baptized. They answer the call of Jesus to be baptized. Water baptism is such an important part of our being discipled, and here's why. Number one, it's a step of obedience. Obey. Obey all I have commanded. So Jesus commanded you obey. You get baptized. Number two, it's a way, a baptism is a way to go public with your faith. When you are baptized, you are saying to all who witness it, I've come into a relationship with Jesus, and I want to go public with my faith. And going public doesn't mean you're perfect. What it means is you are progressively becoming more like Jesus, and you want to tell people that. You want to public and say, I'm now following Jesus. I'm going to progressively become more like Jesus. Number three, baptism is symbolic. It symbolizes and identifies with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So when you go down into the water, it's like going into a grave. And when you come up out of the water, it's like being resurrected in your new life in Christ. So it's very symbolic. And finally, um, after you're baptized, of course, then you have taken that first step of obedience. You can practice obedience going forward. Thanksgiving Eve this year, we'll have a baptism service We have one planned, and you can be a disciple of Jesus and take that first step of obedience and be baptized. So go online and register to be baptized. Here at Oak Hills Church, folks, we value outsiders and insiders. We value people outside our church and desire to point them toward faith in Jesus. And we value people inside our church and desire to help them on their journey becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. If you'd like to come into a relationship with Jesus today, I'd like to pray with you. If you'd like to become a disciple of Jesus today, I'd like to pray with you. So would you bow your heads? And before we leave today, let's have a prayer together. This core value applies to everybody in this room, and it applies to everyone who's watching. Because we're either an insider or an outsider. I know there's some outsiders here. There are some outsiders watching. You just, you know what it feels like to be outside the faith. You've been thinking about it. You've been drawn to a faith. You believe in the spiritual things. You believe in the supernatural. You've been exploring what this means, and you're, you're wondering about Jesus. I'd like to pray with you if you'd like to receive Jesus into your heart today because there are some of you who you really do believe not only intellectually but emotionally you believe there's something you sense in your heart that you know is so true and so real about who Jesus is 
and you, you really want to just tell Jesus that you believe and you want to receive, you can just say a prayer in your heart, something like this. Jesus, I just want you to know I do believe in you. And right now, I want to receive you into my heart and my life. I want to ask you to come in and re- really redeem me. I repent of my past and my sin. I receive your salvation. I really do want to follow and obey. I want to walk with you. Lord, I pray your blessing upon people who have just talked with you and invited you into their heart. And Lord, right now I pray for those of us who want to be disciples. I pray that you take us to a place of obeying, not just have you as our Savior, but as our teacher. Take us to a place of obeying all things in every area of our life. And Holy Spirit, speak to us right now about what that means going forward. And Lord, I pray that um, all of us would be so welcoming. We'd be welcoming. We'd welcome people to know us, and we'd welcome people to know you, Jesus, as you lead and guide us. And we pray this in your powerful, wonderful name. All authority has been given to you, Jesus, and we pray in that authority. Amen. 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 Well, it's been great being with you. I really have enjoyed sharing this series, and... uh, I hope that as you leave today, the Lord will, again, just speak to you about things the Lord has spoken today. If you, on your ride home, if you're with somebody, maybe talk about it, what you thought about. That'd be great. Listen, we'd love to pray with you. Jim and Ben are right over here, and they'd love to pray with you today. If you came in with a need, if there's something on your heart, if you know somebody who needs a healing touch, um, come on up and let them pray with you. The other thing you can do you can go to our website, you go online, you hit connect, you scroll down to prayer and care. And there you can just leave us your prayer request and we'll pray for you this week. If you came to uh, believe and receive Jesus today, when I was praying, you just opened your heart to Jesus. Then the same thing, go to our website and you go to connect and you go down to follow Jesus. I want to encourage you to go there, okay? And just take a look. There's some tools there to help you know what that means. The final thing, the Lord is speaking to some of you about being baptized. You know, this week we were at um, the city. We've been at the city council meeting a lot lately. And um, we had approved for 1570 for our plans for 1570. It's taken a while, but they've fully approved it. But the the meeting we were at, there were a bunch of... uh, new firefighters, Egan firefighters, and they were going to be sworn in. Well, actually only two, but there was a whole bunch of other ones who were there to support them. And so they all come in, and the two that are going to be sworn in, you know, they got their kids, and it was pretty moving, really, because they raise their right hand, and they pledge, and, um, and then when they get their badges, one guy had his wife put it on, another guy had his little daughter put it on. It's pretty moving. And I was thinking about this message, and I was thinking about, what if firefighters just were like, yeah, I'd like to sign up to be a firefighter. Where do I sign up? You go, well, you know, it's got to be some training, you know, we're going to... I don't know, sometimes we do that with Christianity. Where do we sign up? Oh, I'm in, you know. It's training. In this world, there's training. We become disciples. We need that training. We need to change. We need to get ready. And so, yeah. Anyway, I just thought of that. Um, Next week, we're going to continue with this. Outsiders and insiders with our guest speaker, Mark Doreen. If you brought an offering today, you can put it in the boxes out in the lobby. And we'd love to have you hang around and have some coffee. God bless you. We'll see you.